we are talking about something very different today. Uh, we haven't talked about children. And mind you that you don't have NFL analysis and things like that. You have to use maybe your indirect ophthalmoscopy. And uh, maybe most of them will not be even cooperative. And you will see many optic disc anomalies like this. Be it a retina specialist, be it a cornea specialist, be it a pediatric ophthalmologist, be it any, any ophthalmologist. So, if you know the congenital optic disc anomalies, any syndrome in a child, 60% of the syndromic patients will have something on the face. Either their eyes are normal or abnormal, or they will have some hemangium on the face. Yeah, along with the brain abnormalities, you know that optic disc is an extension of the brain. 60% of these patients will have something wrong in the brain as well. So when they come, these diseases may be very rare. And if you diagnose them, you need to know little bit of embryology. The first thing, the, this thing happens after 22 days. You have four parts, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, rhombencephalon, and the spinal cord. This happens on the 22nd day of embryo. And then you have neural tube formation, optical vesicle formation, then there is a choroidal fissure. They can have different optic now abnormalities and they can also have coloboma involving the iris, sclera, and also choroid. And if you see, you have seen many normal discs and you need to really these chil uh, see these children under indirect ophthalmoscopy. Then only you will see this is small size, medium size, and large size. Because most of them, you can't put them on slit lamp for a 90D or 78D. This is one of the normal discs. And there are two groups when uh, you talk about congenital optic disc anomalies. One is small disc, or the other one is large or excavated disc. So this is small disc. We call it as optic disc or optic now hypoplasia. We'll come to the details of it. And this is, you can see a atrophic patch and there is a slight tilting of the disc here. And you can see a very large disc which is excavated here. And you can also see very large disc. Congenital optic disc anomalies can also affect the surrounding tissues around the optic now. This is one of them with morning glory syndrome. And this is, if you see, there is an abnormality here. You can see that's the pit, optic disc. So most of the times, this can be even diagnosed as glaucoma. These two can be diagnosed as glaucoma as well. And this is uh, the staphyloma you can see. And that's the optic disc coloboma and a pit with surrounding retinal damage. And this is again a coloboma. And you can have different manifestations of this. They can have a pure isolated optic disc coloboma or a retinal coloboma like this. You can have a combination. You can use some of these technologies in older children. And you can see this typical two pits there on both sides. You can see there are two pits with the optic disc. So there are two things you need to remember whenever you see this patient. Bilateral cases, they'll come to you with poor vision and nystagmus. And that's why you know that it's a bilateral anomaly. Unilateral, most of the times they will present to a pediatric ophthalmologist or a squint surgeon, with most of the times they will have strabismus. This is pearl number one to differentiate whether it is primary, uh, bilateral or unilateral. This is pearl number two. General workup for this patient remains the same. Genetic test, syndromic association, MRI, neurological association, endocrine, as well as some of the other tests we need to do. Here we talk about transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and interdisciplinary. If you don't talk to your pediatric neurologist, you may not come up with the complete diagnosis. So it should be interdisciplinary because Multidisciplinary, you refer, you don't talk to them, and then patient may not get the full treatment. One more pearl is, if you see a smaller disc, 
likely that they will have a midline defect. If you see a larger disc with excavation, mostly they will have encaphalocele. I'll show some examples. Pearl number three, unilateral cases, the excavated disc is usually larger compared to the other disc. Usually they are myopic and they will come up with lazy eye to you. And this is one of the example. You can see the abnormal optic disc pit disc is larger than the other eye. Whenever you see this, most of the fellows and residents ask, should we do an MRI? Optic disc pit, myelinated nerve fiber layer, megalopapillae, tilted optic disc, optic disc dysplasia, you don't have to do an MRI or no neuroimaging is required, except one of the exception is optic disc pit can have cyst in the orbit. So for that, probably you need to do a CT scan of the orbit. So coming to optic disc hypoplasia, your optic canal is normal, the opening in the sclera is normal size, but there are no enough nerve fibers to fill that. That's why you will have this small side disc, double ring sign, probably because of the pigmentation around that. Third thing is they will have increased vascularity and the diameter between the disc and macula is more than three. The ratio is usually three. So you can see this picture. They have a triad of small disc, tortuosity, RNFL damage, and double ring sign. This is optic disc hypoplasia. What is important? They can even have it segmental. What's most important is, you can see here, there is no septum absence of septum pellucidum. You can see, and also in this picture, you can see corpus callosum is thinned out. So this is called Demorcius syndrome. Approximately 40% of these patients have either absent septum or the corpus callosum abnormality. If you see an infant, if you have been called to a ICU or a pediatric an ICU with the optic disc hypoplasia, before sending them to an MRI, you should do a hormonal test because all these things can affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis and if you give a GA for MRI for this patient, they can die because if they have any axis hypoplasia, they will have a adrenal insufficiency. So before doing, if a child is coming to you after six years or eight years or four years, probably you can go with the MRI and then hormonal test. And they can also have Segmental, you can see here, they can have segmental hypoplasia, typically if the mother is diabetic. They can have a significant hypoplasia, bilateral, if the mother is on any alcohol or any kind of drug abuse. So this history is very important. Also, you should remember that if the brain is damaged because of hypoxic ischemic damage, you can see the size of the optic disc. It just looks exactly like optic disc hypoplasia. This is not syndromic hypoplasia. This is secondary to the damage to the cerebral tissues. And also, most of this, if you see this disc, many of the time, these patients are diagnosed, misdiagnosed as congenital glaucoma. So this is, many times they are referred as congenital glaucoma. And if you see this disc once, you will never forget optic disc hypoplasia. So that's about optic disc hypoplasia. The next thing is optic disc coloboma. There are significant associations in the form of different syndromes. I'm not going into the detail. That's why whenever you see a patient, look at their face, look at their ear, look at their mouth, look at their nose. This gives you information about most of this. For example, if they have golden heart syndrome, what do you expect? There could be a preauricular tag, there could be Duan syndrome, there could be esotropia. So you need to put together and come to this syndromic association because most of the times you can't remember everything. But if you see something wrong, then you can go back and check this syndromes. 
So this is the optic disc coloboma as well as uveal coloboma. Most often it is diagnosed or misdiagnosed as glaucoma even in adult age group. So they can have vision loss. What you have to monitor is foveal or paramacular bundle involvement. They can have cyst arising from the optic nerve sheath. That's why imaging of the orbit is very important and they can also develop periapapillary CNVM and also they can have serous macular detachment. You can see one of the complications which has happened and they have even lasered it in spite of that the patient has. So the next one is morning glory anomaly. I don't know how many of you have seen. This is morning glory and it does not look as beautiful. You can see there is a central tuft, peripapillary vessels coming from the periphery and the size of the disc is always, always large and there is a funnel shaped excavation and the central portion always has a tuft there. This can be unilateral or it can be even bilateral. One of the notable things you have to see is these vessels, peripapillary vessels, they always have a straighter course in morning disc glory syndrome. In addition, this is one of the publication I have seen. I have seen just one patient I could not record. So you can see the vessels within that tuft of tissues, they can contract as well as they can uh, relax. You can see this is the contracted one and after some times it relaxes. So there will be pulsatile swelling on the optic disc. This is one of the association. So they have numerous ocular association in the same eye as well as in the other eye. And most important again, they have here the problem is, this is the larger disc. So you are looking at encephalocele. You can see sometimes they can have hormonal deficiencies, they can also, if the child is newborn with the very big encephalocele, child can have even respiratory difficulties. In addition, this is mostly seen in the Japanese patients, but we are also seeing many patients with Moya Moya disease. This is basically hypoplasia of the ICA. This is why uh, you need to get MRA, MR angiography for all of these patients to see and also Doppler studies to look at the vessel abnormality. Usually many of the people, morning glory syndrome, they'll get the MRI, there is no problem and then they will watch. But this has to be because this is a life-threatening problem they can have. In addition, they can have face, everything is there in the face. Most of the times if you see, that's more than enough. P stands for posterior fossa abnormalities. H stands for hemangioma, you can see this hemangioma. A stands for arterial abnormalities. You can see they can have cerebral vessel vascular problem and they can have cardiac defects. E stands for eye defect. It looks like mostly morning glory syndrome. It, there are, it's called morning glory anomaly, not the syndrome. And they can also have sternal defects when it is called P-H-A-C-E-S, that is phases syndrome. And they can also be seen in oral facial hemangioma. So most of the times when you look at this patient, you need to rule out the optic disc anomalies. And also this is one of our patients. You can see the they have microconia. Both of them had uh, undergone surgery in one eye. They have very good vision in this eye. And they also have auricular abnormalities. This is called oculo-auricular abnormality or a syndrome. You can see and most of them have cataract, coloboma, as well as morning glory anomaly-like picture. So with this dysmorphism, most of the times, even without this genetic mutation, you can come to a diagnosis of oculo-auricular syndrome. Why it is important? You need to send these patients for ENT evaluation as well. Most of the times, this is one of the problem, what you can see, you see this disc, mostly it's uh, labeled as normal disc. What exactly happens is the vessels are coming from periphery. There is no other problem. This is called vacant disc syndrome or a renal coloboma. 
Why it is important? If the patient wants to go for a transplant or a renal transplant, they want to donate their kidney, they may not have any kind of problem at the beginning. And all these patients has to have an ocular checkup to look at this syndromic association. This is called papillorenal syndrome. It simulates something like morning glory. It's not really morning glory syndrome because there is no central tuft here. It's a vacant looking disc. So that needs to be uh, seen. And this is the optic disc fit. Usually it is unilateral and you can also see bilateral and also you can see in one eye multiple pits as well. And most of the times their visual acuity is normal unless there is a subretinal fluid which can uh, lead to other things. One of the good news is that you don't have any CSF, uh, CNS malformation in this kind of patient. Tilted disc, most often we see, they are associated with oblique astigmatism and they can also have field defects. Myelinated nerve fiber layers, we see more often, it's, I think it's one of the most common and they usually have myopia as well as amblyopia. And what you need to treat is their refractive error as well as these patients need patch therapy to improve their astigmatism. In summary, I would say refractive error and its correction in subtle optic disc anomalies, occlusion therapy, early intervention is very, very important. If a mother comes with the bilateral optic disc hypoplasia, they need all these kind of investigation, but they need to plan their studies and everything from day one. I think that's why the early intervention is very, very extremely important. And identification, here I would say that interdisciplinary approach is very, very important. Otherwise, you will miss some of these things. And some cases need possible vitro-retinal intervention, especially with the optic disc pit. And in unilateral cases, you also have to take care of your strabismus. Thank you very much.